In a post-apocalyptic world, a nuclear power plant is on the brink of explosion, threatening to irradiate everyone in the vicinity, turning them into zombies. Morgan and his group have only 12 hours left to repair their airplane. Alicia finds the children's residence and tries to persuade them to leave with her on the plane. However, Annie doesn't trust anyone's help and insists they can avoid the radiation while searching for them. Alicia kills the zombies they had set up forcing Annie and Max to relocate to the forest to reset their defenses. Suddenly, a zombie breaks free from its restraints, alarming Annie. More zombies escape, forcing Annie and Max to quickly retreat. Hearing their distress call over the radio, Alicia rushes to help. There's a large group of zombies behind Annie, and the kids rush to let them in. However, they wonder if the wooden door can withstand the zombie assault. The children, overwhelmed by the situation, realize the door won't hold for long. The kids are all a little freaked out at this point. Alicia, standing at the forefront, asks about their ammunition. Frustrated, Max tells her that their guns are empty and just for show. Alicia takes charge, asking for her weapons back to hold off the zombies. Annie still doesn't trust Alicia, but Max makes her believe in Alicia's abilities because he saw Alicia fight at the crash site. If she wants to do something to them, there's no one here to stop her. As Annie hesitated, the zombies had already forced a gap in the door. Reluctantly, Annie handed the weapons back to Alicia. Several zombies squeezed through the gap. Alicia walked onto a narrow bridge, turned to them, and said, quickly find a way out. I'll buy you time. The children, no longer hesitating, began to retreat. Alicia, armed again, was like a goddess of war, her movements efficient and deadly, almost every strike fatal. She actively ran towards the door, trying to buy as much time as possible for the children's escape. Longtime fans knew how long the weapon in Alicia's hands had been with her. She wielded it skillfully, a simple slash or stab easily penetrating the zombies' skulls. After dealing with a few zombies, Alicia quickly asked Annie if they had left. Max said they needed more time. Alicia turned back to the door as more zombies began to enter. By then, the children had almost reached the shore using the rope. Alicia continued to hold off the zombies, having lost count of how many she had killed. Just as she had killed one zombie, another pounced on her, knocking her to the ground. Alicia, exerting all her strength, pushed the zombie away, the barrel of her gun piercing the zombie's skull. When she pulled it out, blood splattered on her face. Fortunately, the wooden door held, giving her a moment to breathe. Looking at the zombie, Alicia felt something was amiss. The zombie's chest bore a small cylinder, indicating it was a radiation-infected zombie. A moment of panic flashed through Alicia's mind, but there was no time for fear. She realized they couldn't keep this up and had to lead the zombies away. Alicia told Annie, you can't protect them here. Take them to the truck stop and leave. That's the best protection for them. Annie, abandoning her stubbornness, led them to the truck stop. Then Alicia began knocking on the wood, intending to attract the zombies elsewhere. In the evening, Victor and Charlie also arrived at the truck stop with a propeller. Soon after, the group of children arrived there by car. Luciana introduced the children to Victor and Charlie. When asked where Alicia was, Annie replied that they didn't know. Meanwhile, Alicia arrived at a body of water. She wanted to clean the blood off her face, feeling panicked about the possibility of being irradiated. Just then, Morgan called her over the radio, asking if she was okay. Alicia almost lost control of her emotions, but as the strong warrior she is, she composed herself and told him she was fine. Helping others is difficult, she thought. Sometimes even protecting oneself is a challenge. Morgan and Alicia agreed on a meeting place. At that moment, the sound of the air raid siren filled the air, signaling that the nuclear reactor was close to failure. The end of the siren sound would mark the explosion and spread of radiation. The next day, a figure was showering, and it was Alicia who had found Morgan. This was a method suggested by Grace to remove radiation from the body. The alarm from the nuclear power plant continued. Grace said they should leave soon as the plant could explode at any moment. She returned the clean weapons to Alicia, expressing uncertainty about Alicia's safety without proper testing equipment. Just then, zombies, which they thought they had evaded, appeared at the end of the road. Morgan couldn't help but curse. Luciana and others were nearby, clearing the runway for the final takeoff and they couldn't let the zombies affect the plane's departure. Morgan said they would find a way to lead the zombies away. Luciana mentioned that the plane still needed some time to be ready. However, there was another problem. John and Dwight, who had gone to look for Dwight's wife, were out of contact. Morgan couldn't worry about that now. They had to lead the zombies away. 
The car moved slowly forward with the zombies. With Grace's plan to lead them towards the nuclear power station, they stopped the car by the roadside. Using the sound of the air raid siren to attract the zombies, they lay down and waited for the zombies to move forward. Morgan said they would return once the zombies reached the hill ahead. At that moment, Alicia realized something was wrong. They then noticed the air raid siren had stopped. Followed by a huge explosion, the nuclear reactor had finally exploded. A zombie lunged at the car window. Zombies in front were drawn by the noise and started moving towards the car. They had no choice but to leave quickly. However, in her panic, Grace crashed the car into another vehicle nearby and got it stuck. They had to abandon the car and run. Morgan quickly contacted Luciana, telling her to get the plane ready as they were on their way. But they were being followed by a group of zombies. In this zombie-infested area, a nuclear power plant had exploded. They had to leave before the radioactive dust spread further. Their only hope of escape was the recently repaired airplane. Everyone worked together to clear the runway. Victor and Althea were conducting the final checks on the plane, ready to take off as soon as everyone was assembled. However, John, who had gone out to help Dwight find his wife, was now unreachable, causing anxiety for both of them. They had been rushing back since hearing the air raid siren. They've managed to find a working car, but it's broken down on the road. Dwight explained that after several years of the apocalypse, much of the gasoline had deteriorated. Stepping out of the car, they saw the black mushroom cloud, instantly realizing what had happened. Naomi's voice came through the radio, relieved to contact John. She urged him to return quickly as almost everything was ready for takeoff. John said they might not make it. Their car had broken down. Naomi immediately asked their location to come and get them. John replied it was too far and they would try to return as soon as possible. However, he asked her to promise one thing, whether he made it back or not. She must persuade everyone to leave on the plane. Although there are a thousand reluctance John still adjusted his emotions. Deep down, he loved Naomi dearly. After a long struggle, he said his goodbyes. Naomi, helpless, promised John she would leave on the plane. John's last words were I love you. Knowing he wouldn't make it back, Dwight felt very sorry, as John had gone out to help him find his wife. Just then, John spotted something. The wind direction near the plane started changing, indicating that the radiation was spreading towards them. Time was running out. Morgan's voice came through the radio, urging everyone to board the plane. When Luciana asked where Morgan was, he replied he was very close to them. Just as he finished speaking, they saw Morgan and Alicia running out of the forest. Upon learning that John hadn't arrived yet, Morgan said they would wait for John and Dwight until it was absolutely necessary to leave. However, they needed help as a horde of zombies followed them out of the woods. Their only option now was to hold off the zombies as long as possible to allow the plane to take off. Victor and Althea were responsible for piloting the plane and were currently activating its various functions. They were immensely tense, as the plane had not been officially started since its repair. The propeller began to slowly rotate, giving Victor a sigh of relief. At this moment, Morgan and the others were still hoping to delay a bit longer, waiting to see if John and his party could make it back in time. Victor and Althea encouraged each other, knowing the lives of everyone depended on their hands. The zombies were getting closer to the plane, and they couldn't be dealt with in a short time. Althea informed Morgan via radio that they couldn't delay any longer, or else they wouldn't have enough fuel to cross the mountain range. Is everyone ready? They all raised their guns. Morgan was about to give the order to fire at the zombies to buy time for John to arrive. But Naomi said, let's go. I promised him not to let everyone miss the plane because of him. Seeing the zombies approaching, Morgan knew what choice to make. He instructed everyone to quickly board the plane. He told Victor over the radio to take off as soon as he gave the signal. The group hurried to the door of the plane. And at that moment, the sound of a car horn came from behind the zombie horde. A car broke through the zombies, it was John and Dwight, who had finally found a vehicle and made it. Naomi finally breathed a sigh of relief. They made it onto the plane just in time. As the zombies nearly reached the tail of the plane, Morgan gave the command to depart. And Althea and Victor took a deep breath and started the plane. The plane sped up. With only a few zombies clinging on persistently, the plane moved along the runway. Victor and Althea were extremely nervous. Without a smooth takeoff, everything was uncertain. The radioactive dust was also reaching them at the same time. Althea said they needed to lighten the load to take off. Morgan and John quickly dealt with two zombies and threw the netted ropes down. The effect was immediate, and the plane successfully lifted off the ground. Victor and Althea tensed up for the next big challenge, escaping the radioactive dust cloud in the air. Following Victor's experience, they steered the plane to the right, successfully avoiding the dust. 
and then broke through the fog to ascend higher. Everyone on the plane had never ridden such a thrilling vehicle in their lives. Fortunately, the plane began to stabilize, giving them hope. Relieved smiles appeared on everyone's faces. Dwight missed his wife. Morgan was quietly watching his old mate. The children were convinced that this would be an experience they would never forget. John and Naomi were grateful to be reunited. Victor began comforting Althea, suggesting she look at the beautiful scenery outside the window to relax. The rainbow after the storm was so beautiful. Althea, so strong throughout the mission, had almost suffocated. Now, she finally relaxed a bit. The plane continued towards home. In real life, we should also be positive and optimistic. Even if you are in a low point, persisting in flying past it leads to beautiful scenery. Let's encourage each other. But there was still the significant challenge of landing. Those familiar with planes know that landing requires landmarks for guidance. To provide guidance for the plane, Sarah came to the jeans factory again, coincidentally meeting Logan, who was about to leave. In fact, Logan didn't care about the factory at all. He occupied it merely to look for something. Now, the factory was in complete disarray, indicating that whatever they were searching for wasn't there. They no longer needed the place. Sarah directly stated her purpose. Her friends had gone to a far place because of him and were now flying back. She needed his truck fleet to turn on their headlights to serve as a landmark for the plane. She warned him that if he stood by idly this time, he would regret it for life. But Logan didn't care at all. He had no intention of helping others. Searching the entire factory, Sarah only found three glow sticks which were practically useless, just when they didn't know what to do. A car approached from a distance, they tensed up, as there were few good people in this post-apocalyptic world. The car drove straight towards them, but it turned out to be Daniel returning after finishing his task. Sarah let out the cat they had been keeping for Daniel. Daniel said he heard their conversation on the radio and had brought some useful items. He urged them to unload the goods before dark. Daniel had brought party lights, unexpectedly useful for the situation. Wendell with limited mobility, was in charge of guarding the power source. The plane soon flew over the mountain range towards the landing site. The passengers on the plane were somewhat tired. Victor urgently called Sarah. She informed him that they were finishing up and advised them to watch the ground. Althea seemed to spot something a colorful ribbon of light. Victor excitedly told everyone to look. Meanwhile, Wendell, guarding the power source, spotted a zombie emerging from the woods. He didn't raise an alarm, confident in handling a single zombie. Wendell calmly moved his wheelchair to the side of the zombies. Then he turned the wheelchair and turned on the switch behind him. But unfortunately, another zombie approached from the front. Wendell struggled to pull out his shotgun, but it was too late. The zombie tore the power line, plunging the runway into darkness. Althea instantly realized something was wrong, with fuel running low. Their only option was to land. Victor's anxious voice came through the radio. Wendell also pulled the trigger and killed the zombies with one shot. Sarah and Daniel realized something was wrong. Wendell made his decision at this point, and he flung himself down in a flash. Victor is still repeatedly asking if anyone has received the message. Wendell said over the radio to Sarah that if he didn't survive, her beer was the worst he'd ever tasted. But he still loved her. Sarah, not knowing what happened, understood that Wendell was saying his last words. Wendell watched the plane nearing the ground, knowing he might get crushed by it, but still struggled to crawl towards the generator. Althea had no choice but to prepare for an emergency landing without guidance. Akin to landing blindfolded, she alerted everyone to brace themselves for the imminent landing. Tension rose again among the passengers. Having escaped radiation, they now faced the possibility of dying in a crash. In the final moments, Wendell managed to restore the power, with the plane only about 10 meters from the ground. This gave Victor and Althea a brief window to react. The plane began to shake violently upon touching down, leaving everyone uncertain about a safe landing. Fortunately, the plane eventually stabilized, prompting a sigh of relief from even Morgan. Wendell was tearfully emotional, and Victor laughed heartily, feeling this was the greatest thing he had ever done. The first words from Morgan and others after disembarking were, we're still alive. Although not separated for long, the life and death experiences made them cherish their time together even more. After disembarking from the plane, everyone had a sense of having narrowly escaped disaster. They greeted Daniel and others, embracing warmly in relief and joy. Althea and Daniel, being old acquaintances, shared a warm reunion. Everyone swore never to board that plane again. The children were also ready to start their lives anew. Sarah's cheerfulness broke the children's inhibitions. Daniel stayed until the end and Alicia rushed to hug him first. This is the team that was formed from the beginning, and they hugged each other tightly, expressing their thoughts of each other. 
Having gone through so much, their reunion was especially meaningful. Daniel then noticed Dwight next to him. Dwight, a loner himself, simply said hello. Charlie hugged Daniel as soon as he got off the plane. For Daniel, who had lost his daughter, Charlie's presence brought some color back into his world, filling the void of his lost daughter. He may have taken Charlie as his daughter, so he came back again, and inadvertently did everyone a big favor. Charlie naturally felt the paternal warmth from Daniel and saw him as a father figure, filling her own need for paternal affection. Seeing Victor approach, Daniel admitted he had been wrong about him, his opinion entirely changed by Victor's actions. Everyone was safe and sound, and there was nothing more joyous than that. At that moment, Morgan's radio crackled to life with a woman's voice. Morgan began to ask, Who are you? The woman replied, Was that your plane flying over? After their experience with Logan, Morgan became cautious. The woman explained, We've heard your radio broadcasts before and seen your boxes on the roadside. We never dared to believe it. But now, seeing your plane, we do. We need your help. Then the woman's voice disappeared. A car approached from the distance and drove up to where Morgan and the others were. They immediately became alert. The person who got out of the car was Logan. Morgan and the others were seeing Logan for the first time. The man who had deceived them into going to the mountains, nearly costing them their lives. Morgan asked, What are you doing here? Logan replied, If you want to help the woman on the radio, you should listen to me. I have a proposal. They were not in a forgiving mood towards the man who had deceived them. Logan continued, I had a reason for deceiving you into going to the other side of the mountain range. Haven't you noticed the unprecedented hurricanes and the increasingly broken world? People can't get where they want to go anymore, because the petrol is starting to go bad. Logan mentioned that Clayton, the former owner of the factory, had realized this problem. He had arranged for some people to maintain some resources. With the addresses recorded in his journal, I thought the journal was in the factory, which is why I deceived you away. But despite turning the factory upside down, I couldn't find it. The journal should still be in your possession, right? Luciana candidly admitted that it was still with her. Logan then said, Give me the journal, and I can take you there. Luciana and Victor questioned Logan, asking, How do we know this isn't a trap? Why didn't you bring your guards to steal the journal? Logan responded, saying, If they knew I came to you, they would kill all of us. The gasoline is deteriorating fast. If you want to help others, are you planning to walk? We can work together to find resources. 